Perhaps the most conflicting feeling for a follower of true crime is an undeniable fascination with the morbid. The sense that perhaps if you develop a certain level of interest in the perpetrator of evil deeds, you may be guilty of unwittingly lending them a sort of undeserved gravitas. But despite how disturbing that thought may be, there is just no escaping that there are some cases where the criminals at the centre of them are, no matter how depraved, utterly captivating. Today's is not one of those cases. This is Basil Barutsky. Basil Barutsky is not particularly intelligent, nor is he particularly stupid. He is not particularly tall, nor is he particularly short. He is not particularly well-kempt, nor is he particularly scruffy. One might say of Basil Barutsky that the most remarkable thing about him is precisely how remarkably unremarkable he is. The only notable thing about him is that he is responsible for what has been sometimes described as one of the worst acts of domestic violence in Canada's history. Though the term domestic violence doesn't really do justice to the gravity of his crimes. On September 22nd of 2015, Basil Barutsky murdered three women he had grievances with in a spree killing that spanned the course of several hours and miles. At 7.30am he left his apartment, drove to the cottage of 66-year-old Carol Culloughton, and strangled her to death with a television cable. He then drove 20 miles to the Wilno home of 36-year-old Anastasia Kuzik and fired a shotgun into her neck. Kuzik's sister, Eva, was also in the house at the time and managed to run to safety and call the police. Barutsky then drove another 20 miles to the Foymount Road farmhouse residence of his former partner, 48-year-old Natalie Warmerdam, who he also shot in the neck after chasing her through the house. He then continued driving for a time and eventually surrendered himself to officers in a field off of Kinburn Side Road in Kinburn, Ontario. The following morning, he is interviewed by Detective Sergeant Kaylee O'Neill. The interview could be summarized as nearly five hours of contemptible self-pity and tiresome ranting. As a result, even a heavily abridged version may be somewhat of a slog to get through. That being said, it's still an interesting case study of how an individual can be both profoundly wicked and extremely boring all at the same time. There you go, sir. That's uh, your food and coffee on the left there. What I want to make sure is that there's no misunderstanding about what we're here talking about today. And really all I want to know is what's your understanding of why, why we're here right now, Basil? Is it okay to call you Basil? Is that what you normally go by? No, Basil. Basil? Here we get our first glimpse into Basil Barutsky's underlying narcissism. Most people unfortunate enough to be named after a culinary herb would not go out of their way to correct someone for having a less embarrassing interpretation. Basil, however, is insistent that Detective O'Neill gets his stupid name right. O'Neill then proceeds to cover his bases by making sure Barutsky understands his right to consult with counsel under Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms, a simple formality that Barutsky draws out for several minutes with a series of terse and evasive answers to simple questions, such as do you understand and does that make sense? So if you'd like to speak with a lawyer at any time today, Basil, you can just let me know and I can make that happen for you, okay? <sighs> so would you, like to, would you like to talk to one right now? No point, I just said. There's no point right now? If you change your mind and you decide you'd like to talk to one later, will you let me know? Does that seem fair? I'll let somebody know. Sorry, I couldn't hear you, Basil. I'll let somebody know. Okay. Well, I mean, I'm here, right? I'm, I'm the one that can make that happen for you. So if you let me know, if you change your mind, I'll be more than happy to, uh, to get a lawyer on the phone for you. Is that fair? No. Okay. Barutsky continues to sulk between unnecessarily long pauses, specifically complaining about a history of being maliciously prosecuted and treated poorly by authorities. Detective O'Neill also takes Barutsky's medical history, a process which Barutsky again insists on making extremely tedious. Were you able to get any sleep last night? I have no idea if I slept on some steel bench. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine what my back of the field like? No humanity whatsoever. Did you did you mention anything to the guard about? The answer when I mentioned is that they're not supposed to be comfortable. 
when I asked him to loosen the handcuff because I had my hand cut off. Who cares? Is it when you were coming over from Ottawa, the cuffs were too tight? Is that what you're saying? And they left me sitting outside here in the car. I kept telling them I can hardly feel my fingers anymore. My whole hand swore up. No, it's not blue. I don't care. I had my hands cut off. I feel things a little different than what you do. Mm -hmm. I was only asking for common sense. Is it fair to say that you're, you're getting that from me now? Getting what? Common sense, some courtesy? No. And so what have, what have I not done here to... You're a police different? officer. I have lots of experience with police officers. I just told you about a car accident and how they treat me. So I don't trust you one little bit. Okay. I know all about your brotherhood. One of you fucks up or lies, the rest of you is all hiding. Doesn't sound like you've had very many positive experiences with policemen. I've right? never had a positive experience with a policeman. Mm -hmm. If there would have been a positive policeman, my whole life would be different. Well, what about the experience we're having right now? Is that positive? I just told you you're a police officer and you're going by that stupid record that you guys made. What, what, what is this record you're talking about anyway? Do you, you have a criminal record? Oh, give me a break. Barutsky's criminal record and the glaring pattern of domestic violence within it has been the source of much criticism toward Canada's correctional system. Though something as extreme and senseless as a triple murder may seem like the sort of thing that nobody could reasonably see coming, many advocates have alleged that in the case of Basil Barutsky, something like what transpired on September 22nd was foreseeable, and reasonable measures could have been taken to prevent it. Barutsky's first count of battery dates back to 1985, with the alleged victim being his wife at the time, Marianne Mask. Barutsky successfully fought the accusation in court and was found not guilty. The couple separated in December of 1993, and Barutsky was charged again with assaulting Mask in February of 1994. Again, Barutsky was found not guilty. Barutsky and Mask somehow reconciled several years later, and then permanently separated in August of 2008 after yet another alleged act of domestic violence in addition to death threats from Barutsky. Again Barutsky walked, but this time in exchange for agreeing to sign a peace bond. Mask alleged during court proceedings in 2011 that Barutsky's acquittal of the 94 assault was due to her being coerced by Barutsky into withdrawing her accusations. A very believable claim, given at one point during the divorce proceedings, Barutsky produced a contract he claimed Mask had voluntarily written and signed in 1994, wherein she surrendered full custody of their children to him and took responsibility for making up her previous accusations. The wording in the document rings so strongly of Barutsky's perspective that it's genuinely farcical to think he could have believed it would ever be taken as genuine, and it was of course disregarded by the judge. All of this only begins to scrape the surface of Barutsky's history of abuse, and Marianne Mask wasn't even one of the targets of his killing spree. We'll unpack the sordid details related to his deceased victims as they come up in the interrogation. Well, one of the reasons I'm also here, Basil, is that I'm sure you're aware of the gravity of the situation and the seriousness of this investigation. I certainly am, given that you've been arrested for these crimes. And there are more, no more serious crimes than murder. I didn't murder anybody. That's right, you killed somebody. Correct? Killed three people, actually. What's the difference between killing and murder? That was show, no, murder. Mm -hmm. This is the cornerstone of Barutsky's moral defense that he derives from amateur theology. The argument is fairly simple and completely asinine. In some versions of the Bible, such as the Torah, the commandment widely known as thou shall not kill actually reads you shall not murder. It is this version which Barutsky has designated as the correct one, and he contends the wording absolves him of any sin in carrying out the killings of his three victims. The act of killing is the mere ending of any given being's life, whether that be an animal or a person, an innocent or a sinner. Murder, however, must be the killing of an innocent. Barutsky contends that his victims were not innocent, as they wronged him in numerous ways, including lying about him in court for financial gain. Leaving aside his characterizations of their actions can be safely assumed to be delusional and or deliberately dishonest. His biblical justification is still seriously flawed. 
For one, while it is true that the Bible clearly sanctions killing under certain circumstances, it does not permit any one individual to take it upon themselves to act as judge, jury, and executioner. Another glaring issue is that if a literalist interpretation of killing offences from the Bible were to be adopted in modern times, even government-sanctioned executions would quickly begin to get severely out of control. Sins such as murder and bearing false witness are not the only acts deemed worthy of the death penalty in Scripture. A multitude of other offences, including homosexuality and fortune-telling, are also listed as high enough crimes to put one on the chopping block. So one of the reasons why I'm here is to give you this opportunity to explain why you killed these three girls. You're putting words in my mouth. I haven't said anything. Just I just asked you a simple question. Why did you kill these girls? That's it. You're putting words in my mouth, but I didn't say that. Which words am I putting in your mouth? Just so. Well, I can't really put a question in your mouth when I'm asking it. And it's interesting how you made the distinction between murder and killing. What that would suggest is that you have some kind of justification for what you've done, which it's also been my experience is always the case. In my career, I've not spoken to one killer who woke up that day and decided they were going to go out and kill somebody. Virtually every single one of them found themselves in a set of circumstances beyond their control. And they reacted, typically poorly, and something happened. There's always an excuse, there's always a reason why. And whether you choose to acknowledge it or not, your opportunity to tell the why is important. Because like I said, what that does, it allows the community to get some understanding of why you did these things. Because on the surface, people just wonder and they will naturally gravitate to what they think is the worst in people. But when you explain why you did these things, then people can get an appreciation for how the situation developed. And sometimes they can even see themselves in that situation. Geez, if that was me, I may have reacted the same way. Now, that only really matters to somebody who cares what anyone thinks about them, which is why I asked you that question initially. It's also been my experience that people say they don't care what other people think. That's usually not true. Everyone cares. It's human nature to care. You cared enough to do what you did, so you're going to have a hard time convincing me that you don't care what people think about you. You wait, Basil. Yeah. Do you have any questions for me? No, I have no idea what you're talking about. They don't make any sense at all. Okay. Do you need me to do explain anything? Am I speaking too fast? Am I speaking clearly? I don't care about hardly this thing. I'm not sure how extensive your involvement is with police investigations. But basically how they work. They're like a big pie, if you can imagine a big pie, okay? And the pie is broken into all kinds of different sections. Detective O'Neill goes into a rather tortured pie analogy, wherein he explains that there are many pieces of the pie of an investigation, and the piece of the pie that Barutsky is responsible for is that of the truth, but the other pieces of the pie may wind up proving that his piece of pie was actually filled with lies, which in turn will damage the credibility of his lies. Barutsky remains unreceptive. Now, sometimes this slice of the pie might be empty altogether, because you could do as you're doing right now and choose not to say anything at all which is completely fine because that's your right. And you can do that. But the risk is, again, we go back to all these other sections of the pie and we use them to prove our case. And there's a chance that you can lose credibility in the end. Now, the third option is that you actually take advantage of this opportunity to tell your side of the story and explain why you took those lives. In which case, the truth stands, because it's the truth, and that's what happened. And then we don't need all these other pieces of the pie to show what happened, because it's your story. And you decided to tell it, as opposed to everyone else making decisions about you, and what kind of guy you are. And this is what I want you to think about, Basil. This is what I want you to do. I want you to look into the uh, past charges against me by those women, and I want you to do that proper investigation from the point of view of what really happened 
and then um, have a retrial, a fair trial, and uh, then we'll talk about uh, reality. So any information you want from me, you can get by simply doing the proper investigation for the past. I was put in jail twice, wrongfully. If you were looking at this investigation, if you were looking at the allegations against you and the evidence, and the content of this case, what would you think about what you've done here and how you're portraying yourself? You're a reasonable guy. What would you make of all this if you were looking at it from the inside in? Would you like to sit back and watch this video of you talking about how, I don't know how many years ago, uh, some investigation went bad for you, some assault investigation, when you're here under arrest for killing three women? Is that what you'd like to see on video? Would you like to see on video how nonchalant and non-interested you look for these cameras right now when three women are dead because you killed them? Nonchalant. Well, I mean, that's the adjective that comes to mind right now. You're not happy for me. You're not you don't have to be happy for me because what's going to happen is when I'm done here, Basil, when I'm done talking to you, I'm going to get up and I'm going to walk into this room and I'm going to go on to the next case. And I won't give this a second thought. Because there's lots of other cases just like this one. This might be a unique situation for you. It's not unique to me at all. It really isn't. And when I walk out of this room, when we're done here today, your opportunity to fill in that pie yes. and affect the way people think about you and what you've done is gone. This would a liar. Hmm? <sighs> would be with somebody that is supposed to be representing me. I didn't catch the first bite of that, Basil. What about a lawyer? Is going to be representing you? That would be when I would be telling my story to a lawyer that is interested in representing me. This is an interesting contradiction in Barutsky's words and actions. He states that the circumstances under which he would provide his side of the story would be when talking to a lawyer who has his best interests at heart, which is a very sound approach. But Detective O'Neill has already gone to painful lengths to point out that he has a right to a lawyer and that he can be set up with one at any point he chooses to request so. Yet still he chooses to sit in this room and share his perspective of how he is the one who has been wronged, albeit in an excruciatingly drawn out manner. This gives away the fact that his ego does in fact desire for his side of the story to be heard by authorities. He just wants to feel in control and make them work for it. You are not representing me. You are representing evil. No, I'm representing the truth. No. I'm representing three dead girls, three dead women. If you were you'd be looking at Two ex-girlfriends of yours. <coughs> three. three. Three? No, I don't think Natalie was. I think she turned you down, right? I lived with her for three years. What are you talking about? She came for half the farm. Work on it. Sorry, Anastasia is the one that turned you down. Turned me down. She's quite a, quite a bit younger than you, too. You're not the first guy to be turned down, though. I wasn't turned down by Anastasia. I was dating Carl Culleton, and I was working. Anastasia's house. Okay. She was a friend, like a daughter. She lied in court. Sometimes people are not truthful. A lot. She lied a lot, and the Crown Attorney said, it's okay to lie. <laughs> Whether or not Anastasia Kuzik and Basil Barutsky ever had a romantic relationship wouldn't have really been material to what Barutsky was in court for when Kuzik testified against him. On December 30th of 2013, Barutsky had strangled and beaten Kuzik as well as lighting several of her possessions on fire after she told him she wanted him out of her house. He served just over a year in jail for charges of assault and mischief, being released on December 27th of 2014, despite refusing to sign a court order prohibiting him from contacting Kuzik. He also disobeyed court orders to attend counselling, a breach of his probation which he was never pulled up on. That was her end statement thing. It's okay, some people lie. So is that what way? What is the point of going to court when it's okay to lie? So is that why you killed these girls, Basil? Because they're, they're not going to get their comeuppance in court? They're going to lie and they're going to escape responsibility? 
If you're a cop, you should know that people that use the system are guilty. What was done to you if the community that hurt you so badly know, that you had to If the community things. wanted to know, they would start an independent inquiry and look into the past. How did it ever evolve to get to this? Because Basil Berutsky is a kind, caring, God-fearing human being. So how you know did what? I guess we that to, is a point we agree on. We need to go back to the past and find out how could this have happened. That is a point we agree on. If there's one thing I do know what people have said about you is you're a kind, caring person, which is why I'm having a difficulty with this contrast in behavior. Basil Barutsky's reputation as a kind and caring person is very mixed. He was indeed known to do kind things, such as free of charge handyman work for friends and neighbours, but even in that instance, his actions were sometimes not as virtuous as they may seem on a surface level. For instance, he began building a deck on his first victim, Carol Culloughton's cottage, without her permission. That was during a period where he was attempting unsuccessfully to initiate a romantic relationship with her. The psychological manipulation that underlies the committing of unwanted charitable acts is very much in line with the sort of behaviour you would expect from a batterer. I didn't even try to see the truth. Get Basil. And then there's even with Anastasia Kruzik. She sells my tractor. When the police are called, the police officer says, that's stealing, that's theft. When the police officer's called, he says, I'm, we're not gonna do anything about it. It's a such sensitive situation. Sensitive? She stole my tractor and sold it. What does that make her out to be? And the police protected that theft. Corruption and corruption. Another police officer, Miller, are you writing them down? Yep. Do you know his first name? No, I never ran into much of him. Pem Pembroke or OBB? Yellow there. Okay. I got a beaten with a baseball bat in the field. I didn't know why I was getting it beaten. And it took a year or two later for me to finally find out Natalie Warmerdan was screwing the neighbor while she was married to her husband. Before I came along, when I came along, he was pissed off. I often wondered why the man didn't like me. I tried to help him. I helped him. Fix his pool, he just, and then one day I'm getting a bait, beaten with a baseball bat because uh, bit my bailer caught fire. I've done nothing wrong, totally innocent. And I find out it's because all those years, the time I was there, it was because I took his affair girlfriend next door. But I had no idea. So I get a beaten with a baseball bat, could have been killed. Miller comes along and the first thing they say is, Basil, you're under arrest. I said, for what? He said, you're drinking beer. So what? I'm on my own property. I'm having a beer after a fire. And it took the Crown Attorney to look that through and see that it was wrong and made Miller go back and charge the guy with assault. The guy hit me three times with a baseball bat. And finally, I got to hit him and broke his nose. Other than that, I would probably be dead. And I ended up charged. Unbelievable. And I'm a cripple. And here's a young guy with a baseball bat beating on me. And in the end, he gets like six months probation or something. He beat me with a baseball bat. Attempted murder. But he was beating on Basil Brutzky. Makes it okay. I understand. I understand how it works. Basil, I want to ask you a question. And it's something I ask a lot of people that I talk to because I'm interested in, 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 in what they think about it. If I was to ask you how you would describe yourself, um, on a day-to-day -day basis, 
in terms of your truthfulness. And let's say we have a scale of one to ten. And a one is a person who never tells the truth. Constant liar. And a ten is the perfect angel. Someone who speaks nothing but the truth all the time. I, Realistically, I, I where would you put yourself? Eight or a nine because I do tell what I would call white lies uh, if I have to go around something so as not to hurt somebody. Or I may not tell something that I know if I think it's going to hurt my daughter or something or that kind of stuff. So, but as far as telling the truth about what's really going on, then I'd be just a 10. You know, I want to lie about anything. I never did. I never lied from the very... Well, I think, I think there's necessity for those little white lies my you're talking father, about. My father told me a long time ago, Basil, have you ever heard of anybody getting caught in the truth? And that's what stuck. People get caught in lies. You can't get caught in the truth. That's true. Also, my dad said, it's not worth doing if it's not hard to do. What I'm doing is very hard. Very hard. So it's worth doing. I'm trying to show the world how wrong the system is. It's wrong what the system done to me. It's and the system is being used by people. I'm not saying there's not abused women out there and the system is doing the right thing for them, but there's also so many that are using more, I believe, are using the system corruptly. Well, if I'm hearing what you're saying, there's a purpose to this killing in the burden that you're trying to take on to change society. It's called justice. I've never had justice in my life. I, from what you've told me, I understand how Natalie and Anastasia fit into this, but I don't understand Carol. The very same thing. I was dating Carol Culleton. Anastasia came along. Well, I knew Anastasia way longer than Carol, but I treated Anastasia like a daughter. She was a friend. She lived in my house with her boyfriend. I ended up kind of half moving in. I still maintained my place. But in the winter when it got cold, I ended up staying more and more at her place than at my place. People may have assumed that there was a relationship going on, but they would have to be cuckoo because there was a 20 some year age difference. And if you don't believe me, simply go and talk to my doctor because I told my doctor she wanted to have something. She walked around, she'd get in the hot tub naked. You ask my doctor. I went there and I said, what is wrong with me? I cannot get an erection. She does all this to me. She'd even sit on my lap. He said, Basil, it's psychological. She's more like your daughter. She's more like your daughter's age. You see her as your daughter. It was actually a turnoff. But in court, when they asked her if we had a relationship, she said yes. And the reason was, or if they said, were you in a relationship? She said yes. That was a lie. She may have wanted it to be more when she tried to part Carl and I, and eventually she did. Mm -hmm. And Carl knew all of this, and I wanted Carl to go to court and testify that she knew all about Anastasia and me treating her like her, calling her like a daughter. And instead, uh, Carl took off with another guy. Then when I got out of jail, Carl's back. She dumps the other guy. So all I fix her cottage all up. I went probably two and a half, three months of there. Every chance I got, cleaning it up, wiring, plumbing, gave her money. Mm -hmm. She lied to me. She 
told me she was so broke, I gave her, I even pulled my own RSPs out and gave her my last peanuts. Based off of the accounts from everyone close to Carol Culloden, Barutsky's characterization of their relationship is purely delusional. Nobody recalls them being romantically involved. Culloden merely hired Barutsky for various repair and carpentry jobs. He would arrive at her residence unannounced so frequently that those around her categorized it as stalking. Oh, for nothing it was all for money. She didn't get much. Natalie got the most. Barutsky's relationship with Natalie Warmerdam began pleasantly enough, and she even believed him when he bemoaned his ex-wife's lying in court about domestic abuse that never happened. Over time, however, he became violent toward her and her son too, escalating to the point where on July 27th of 2012, he was arrested and charged with assault and uttering death threats. He served only 30 days in jail and never attended the court-ordered partner assault response program that was part of his parole. This was all before his battery of Anastasia Kuzik. Anastasia got about, Natalie got about 200,000, 180 or something plus. Well, pretty well all my equipment. And then her son burnt the garage down. Oh, my tools were in there. I got nothing. And uh, Anastasia would have got me for about 20,000. And Carl would have got me for a book. I'm not sure. 13, maybe, or something like that. I don't know. And then she went back with her boyfriend, and she's laughing. Him and her are laughing, calling me the. BF, best friend that'll do anything that she wants. So, all these women used to have put you through the ringer over the years and used you. And they're all connected, they all know each other. They've given you such a hard time. Why do you feel you needed to take on this burden yourself to prove this point after all this suffering you've already gone through, Basil? Like I said, like this is a difficult road you've chosen here. Why are you doing this just to prove a point? Uh, is there not some other way? I have no idea what you're talking about. What are you talking about other way? Uh, I don't know. I'll explain. Well, all these women here that have slighted you or, or lied to you in some way, cheated on you, and you've killed them all to make this point that the justice system doesn't work. And that road you've chosen is going to have consequences. So what I'm saying is with all the suffering that you've already done to this point, dealing with these three women, you know, why, why are you taking on this, this, this burden to draw society's attention to it by yourself? I'm not quite sure what you're saying, but I think that you not think society should open their eyes and change the way they I, I do. Everything has been taken from me. My job, my health, my family, my dignity. You all lost by the police and people that use the police. You, That's the you lost many things. I've lost everything. Do you think it's a little bit selfish on your behalf to take those women's lives for you to prove a point? To prove a point. Selfish? I don't even know what you're talking about. Well, I am going to right now what you're saying. Well, these women that you killed is part of a grand scheme to draw, for you to draw light on the fact that the justice system apparently doesn't work. No, it's not a scheme. Where are you getting this from? There's no scheme. I told you. 
I don't, I was reading the Bible, talking to this lady. I went to bed. All I remember was going to sleep, or I don't even remember going to sleep, and then I woke up, and I don't even know if I drank coffee. I just went out of the house, and I remember at one point thinking about a zombie, and, and, and I remember I was confused, and I, 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 I remember seeing the Our Father, he had married over and over and over, and I was driving. And I, I said, I was talking to myself out loud, or I think I was, maybe I wasn't, but I, I kept saying, God, keep me safe, show me what to do, or stuff, or, and uh, I don't know what, I don't. Heberutsky begins transitioning to a representation of his killing spree that differs from what he was putting across earlier. Whereas before, he stated that he was trying to show the world how wrong the justice system is, now he's beginning to paint a picture where he had no conscious intentions at all, that he was essentially beside himself during the entire episode, heavily implying that a higher power was acting through him. It's a very dubious claim, given, aside from anything else, the systematic execution of the murders. The reason behind wanting to present this narrative is also unclear. It may be a psychological mechanism to lessen his own feelings of culpability. Or perhaps it's to further the notion that these were killings not only sanctioned, but to an extent taken out by God himself. Maybe there's no rationale behind it. Maybe you're just watching the arduous ramblings of a dreary lunatic. It was like a nightmare, or not a nightmare, a kind of dream, or... I remember a zombie. What, what do you mean you felt like a zombie? What, what was going on there? Like, a, like I was beside myself, like I was looking at this from over there. I could see myself. Uh, that's the way it looked at it. I thought I could see myself walking from over there. Over, over, beside myself. But what did you see yourself doing? Walking from the house to the car. I remember, I don't know, I really don't. I would ask him, God, show me what to do. I remember it was, I don't know if I was seeing a light up or, or seeing it in my head. Why would, why would God have you kill those women? Okay, so that seems kind of counterintuitive. Uh, no. What reason could there be for that? No, to me it seemed like... It seemed like God was trying to show me that the commandment isn't thou shalt not kill, it is thou shalt not murder, and that when somebody it's murder to kill somebody that's innocent that's why i couldn't kill myself because i thought about shooting myself but i can't do that because i am innocent i didn't do it wrong because that would be me murdering myself Jesus Christ, that's right. i don't does that make any sense it does so, in terms of Carol and Anastasia and Natalie, would you say you killed them or murdered them? I killed them because they were not innocent. They were guilty. I was innocent. I done nothing wrong. What's your message in all this? It is no message. It's vindication would have been but you're you're not following me here there's two things it's like me walking being the zombie and me over here looking at the zombie it's like two a lot of what i'm telling you is history of 20 years got to here and and then there's the zombie part. So the guy watching the zombie, the zombie is 
me. The guy that's watching the zombie is how I got here. The twenty does that make sense to you? The twenty years of my mm -hmm. ex wife where from where it started to there's always a reason why something happens, right? Does that make any sense? Of course at all? it is. There's always a reason why things happen and you get twenty years of reasons. Do you remember what you did after you left Carol's? Of does that help? If you think about it like a chronology? When you left Carol's and somehow you end up at Anastasia's. I just know I left Carl's and I said, God, what do I do? And I just I remember going to a little bit of construction and I just drove in and I remember thinking that God is really helping me because when I went to Carl's, Carl walked right outside. Mm -hmm. What did she do? And then I asked her, I said, why do you hate me? Or why are you doing this to me? Purple. She closed the door. I was right there. And then I broke the window with my elbow. And I opened, reached in and I unlocked the door. And she said, This is not you, Basil. This is not you. Then she told me that uh, Dave was coming over because the hydro was out. And I said, you're lying to me again. And there was a, a cable TV coil. I picked it up and I hit her with it and I wrapped it around her head. And she just kept saying, this is not you, Basil. This is not you. Basil. Ah. Take my hand for a second. For what? I just want to shake your hands. I want to thank you for being the guy that you said you are this whole time you've been here, a truthful good person. It's a rare experience I get to meet somebody who actually walks the talk to free chief. Walks like what? Yeah. Well, you said you, eight, eight, nine out of ten, you're a truthful person. And you don't lie unless it's to protect somebody, other than the little white lies. I'm not sure why. Well, that's what you're doing right now. You're being truthful. They finally went crazy, didn't they? It wasn't just that day. It's your other days. A couple days before it was maybe right through. Mm -hmm. Take your time, take a minute. Don't punch me, please. I don't know why I wanted to take a gun out of the apartment because I don't know why. So I took it and I hid it in the bush in the garbage bag. But this would mean I, I wasn't doing that. I, I see myself doing that. Does that make sense? I was over there. I'm here. I'm like a camera and I can... Where did you, where did you lay in the bush, basin? Just along the road. But, that way. But, it's all fucked up. I remember thinking that God's making this easy. Because Carl came out the door. Because when I got to Anastasia, she walked out the door. As soon as I walked out, I knew wasn't even at the door, she just walked out. And I asked Anastasia, I just said, Why did you lie in court? And she said, I didn't. And the gun went off. Because it just lies. What happened when you went to Natalie's farm on Tuesday? What happened? I just drove in, walked in the door. She was sitting there. She went in the corner. I followed her. Boom. Walked out. That's it. 
Detective O'Neill's performance in this interrogation is absolutely commendable, even though if viewed casually, one might think he hasn't been doing all that much. To that end, it's a great example of how much can be achieved through simply observing your subject, settling on the approach most likely to elicit information from them, and then staying in that lane with absolute discipline. Note how much detail Barutsky has provided in the last few minutes with limited prompting. Now compare that with his reluctance to engage three hours ago. So one of the reasons about here is to give you this opportunity to explain why you killed these three girls. You're putting words in my mouth. Detective O'Neill has taken Barutsky from being extremely withholding and surly, all the way to a point where he's divulging how the day's events unfolded, to a level that borders on confiding in his interrogator. The detective has achieved this transformation, not through the use of any flashy tricks, but by simply observing that Barutsky's primary desire is to be listened to, and then granting him that wish, all the while feigning a degree of understanding of his actions. He's kept confrontational statements, questions and interjections to a minimum, and from there just allowed time to do the rest for him. And it was funny, it was like I wasn't even pulling the trigger on the gun, the gun was just going off, it was just like, boop, all right. I don't know why that was where we all stood. I don't think so. I didn't see anybody. Where did you go after? And then I drove again. And uh, I was driving. I went to the fat man. I was trying to tell you this. The guy that she was getting those back for him. He was the guy that was selling them. I found out where he lived, a little sawmill. Drove around the place. I talked to two people. I asked them, is the big guy here? And they all said, both said no. One guy said he was there on the other side. The other guy said, no, he's not here. I drove around and then I left. How do you feel about what's happened to these women, Basil? I don't know what to say to you because there's two, two of me. Well, that yeah. doesn't make sense. Does it? Well, let's hear two perspectives. It's not, it's, it's. How do you feel right now? Not at the time is what I'm getting at. Right now, me and you in this room. Empty. Would you take it back if you could? Of course you would. Good. Anastasia, why did you lie? Why couldn't she just have said, I'm sorry, and I'm sure not able to stop of love? That would have been enough. Or see, because it would have stopped right there, but she still lied. And Carl lies. And then I talked to so much about the tr being honest and the truth and positive and, and she's still alive. Do you feel sorry about how it all ended? Of course I feel sorry. Maybe that's why I didn't know. I know why I didn't shoot myself. But I did know that if I kept the gun and waved it around, for sure I would have shot. I was thinking, but not thinking. I was thinking, not think. I think I was thinking a little better when I sat down at that picnic table and I started writing. For some reason, things seem to be more clear. Must have because I didn't move anymore. How long were you there? A couple hours. Did you just find the booze? I'm not sure. Did yeah. you, you have booze though? I had a, fire, a bottle of Farty Creek and a bottle of wine and a little bottle of Fireball. I left the car and we went through the bush back out to the highway and I crossed the highway. And before we found the gun, I left the booze there because I planned on drinking and blowing my head off. 
But then uh, by that time, I start talking, think about it, you know, you can't do that. Basically, you're innocent. If you blow your head off, you'll never go to heaven because... <laughs> I want to tell you another thing with the police. I was not a jail. They were taking me to Killaloo and the paddy wagon. I told them that I need to go to the bathroom. And the paddy wagon stopped in Renfrew from Ottawa to Renfrew. I kept telling them, I need to go to the bathroom and I'm piss my pants. And I have a problem, I got a hernia. I cannot hold. Mm -hmm. Then when we got, we went to Pembroke. I thought, I didn't even know. I thought I was hanging on there so when we get to Pembroke, I'll be able to have a leak. In Pembroke, they leave me in a paddy wagon and they take somebody else in and they leave me up there and I said, I need a piss. Detective O'Neill sits through one last moaning session from Barutsky as he bitterly recounts the time he wet his pants after not being allowed to relieve himself while in police custody. After that, the interrogation is wrapped up. Barutsky will go on to represent himself in court, and during those proceedings he will compose himself in just as an insufferable manner as you've witnessed in this video. Barutsky consistently refused to speak, present evidence, or cross-examine witnesses. Then toward the end of the proceedings, he complained to Ontario Superior Court Justice Robert Maringer that he was never afforded the opportunity to present a defence when it was pointed out by Judge Maringer that he had been provided with aforementioned opportunities and passed on them multiple times, Barutsky simply stated that he did not believe him. Ultimately, Basil Barutsky was sentenced to 70 years without the possibility of parole for his crimes, meaning he will need to live to the age of 128 before being eligible for release. If anyone were to manage to live that long, purely for the sake of making life unpleasant for everyone, it probably would be Basil Barutsky. But fortunately, in all likelihood, no one will ever have a good reason to think about him ever again.